there's never been more opportunity than there is today to literally redefine and reinvent just about everything we do. Let's face it, there's new tools that are emerging just about every day, many of them from AI, some of them even free, that allows us to innovate and be entrepreneurial as well as entrepreneurial. In other words, the need to be entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial on the inside has never been more important. And that's why I'm so excited for today. I'm bringing to you Terry Jones, who is indeed an innovator. Let me just read a little bit about his uh, background for you. Terry has been the uh, CIO, Chief Information Officer of American Airlines Sabre. In other words, he understands technology. He's been the CEO of Travelocity. When Travelocity was taken private, he founded Kayak.com, where he was chairman for seven years. When Kayak.com was sold to Priceline for, get this, $1.8 billion, he founded On Inc., a consultancy that helps companies in their transition to the digital economy. He has served on over 20 boards of directors. He's an amazing keynote speaker and is the author of two really great books that I highly recommend, On Innovation, Turn On Innovation in Your Culture, Teams, and Organization, and Off disruption, the technological disruption coming to your organization and what to do about it. All right, Terry, welcome. Thanks, Dan. Great to be with you. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you. Again, you have been such a great innovator, and I do want to talk about innovation uh, as an entrepreneur. want to get into that, but I especially want to get into entrepreneuring from the inside. Again, entrepreneuring and you did that with Travelocity. Again, you started quite a few successful companies, but let's focus in the beginning on uh, Travelocity. And, and I want to make sure that we're giving all of those that are watching uh, some takeaways, some key actions. So anytime you or I can insert some actions in there, uh, let's do it. So uh, tell me a little bit about your experience with Travelocity. Well, I should lay down some history. As you said, I was CIO of Sabre. Sabre uh, was the computer system of American Airlines, but also automated 40,000 travel agents. And that, that was our key business. But for eight years, we'd had an online product on AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy, where you could make a reservation, but you couldn't get a ticket. Uh, you had to get the ticket from a local travel agent. And eventually the travel agents woke up and said, turn that off. You're selling bullets to the enemy. You know, we don't want to do that. We don't want you to do that anymore. But our chairman said, no, this is pretty important. Give it to Jones. He used to be a travel agent. He's over in IT. We'll hide it over there. <laughs> so <laughs> I took it over. Number one. Yeah. Give it to Terry and ask him to hide it. Anyway, yeah, I couldn't do that. <laughs> so the first thing I did was say, why is it on the Internet? It was 1996. The Internet had just been deregulated. So we put it on the Internet and it grew like a weed. But I had to figure out how to grow this thing, which was really competing with their major customer inside Sabre. So there were kind of four key things that we did. One, I had to fight like crazy with HR to hire people from outside the company. I wanted different perspectives. I wanted startup people. They said, no, hire from the inside. I said, I already got those people. I don't want more of them. They're fine, but I don't need any more. Secondly, um, we had to change culture we had to have a culture where you could fail. Now, an airline, the culture is you never fail. And as passengers, you're all happy about that. But in a startup, you have to be able to fail. And we had a lot of failures. And that was hard to change and teach people that. Part of that involved moving out of the building. I moved out so I could change the culture into an old building, a strip mall. It was a mess, but it was ours. And we disassociated everybody from their apartments because marketing worked for marketing and sales worked for sales. That didn't work. They had to all work for Travelocity. And then finally, our budget was held at the highest level in the company and it was secret because we were losing so much money. Everybody else wanted our money because they could make a profit with it today. But we needed to lose money for a while to make money tomorrow. Uh, and that, that was key. So organizational structure, culture, location, uh, and, and really getting people from the outside were very important. And I talk about that a lot in my book on innovation because we were competing against people like Priceline that were traditional startups and were moving really, really fast. 
Well, there's a couple of things I want to dive into there and uh, and point them out and make them actionable for all of those that are listening, because we have a very global uh, audience and they're all leaders. And um, one of the things is, again, uh, you got to understand your current culture and look at what needs to be different to drive mm -hmm. it. And one of the things that you pointed out that was big is airlines don't fail. I mean, we do not fail because that is not a good thing if you're a passenger. So, uh, but you needed innovation on the inside. And as you said, it involves failure. So, uh, you know, if you're in financial services, guess what? Nobody likes failure. If you're a bank, nobody wants to fail. By the way, that's why they aren't innovative. Nobody in accounting wants to fail. That's why they don't innovate. There's so many industries that are risk averse because of the fear of failure. And one of the principles that I've been uh, teaching for many decades and I've written about in all of the books has been uh, failing fast in order to learn faster. That's right. right? And, uh, and it's a really good one uh, because I think what we do is um, we can be heading towards failure and keep going and plowing along and plowing along instead of having a metric to say, wait, 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 wait a minute. Let's uh, let, uh, are we just heading in the wrong direction? Should we try a different direction? Tell me a little bit more about the failure component, because I want to pick this apart just a little bit, because you gave us four really big ones. Right. Talk a little bit more well, about You know, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, early on, most people listening had forgotten this. You couldn't send video over the Internet. It's only <laughs> 1,200 baud. So I went out and pressed a whole bunch of DVDs that had video that worked in conjunction with the online system so I could show you a picture of a cruise ship or a movie of a hotel, right? And I spent a million dollars getting it out in the stores. And I lost a million dollars. It was a total failure. Nobody cared. And I had to go to my boss, who was the CFO at American Airlines. And you know what CFOs can be like. I was terrified. And I said, I lost a million bucks. And you know what he said? He said, what did you learn? Well, the word spread like wildfire. Terry didn't get fired. But also that this guy was a coach. And coaches don't just throw people off the team. They learn from the mistakes. They watch the game films. They make the team better. And that was a huge culture shift to have a CFO say that. And it helped us a lot. You know, failure can be an open door to success if you take the time to learn from it. And I like to say, kill projects, not people. Um, all the time, the culture is about Dan failed. Well, Dan probably didn't fail. It was probably a bad idea or as poorly executed or something happened. Now, if Dan fails four times, okay, send him to the minor leagues. You know, he's, he's not any good at it. But you have to allow people, projects to fail and give people another chance. Yeah, and I think the real key there is also making sure that it, when failure happens, not if, when failure happens, uh, what is learned from it? And we need to draw that. And then there's another element that you didn't mention, but I know that you did because I know you. And that is sharing what we learned from the mistake. Because oh, yeah. only I'm the only guy that learned from the mistake and you didn't. And we're in the same organization. That mistake will still be repeated and repeated because nobody learned the lesson. So sharing the learning from the mistake is another important element. Well, and, and you and I do that all the time as speakers and as mentors. You know, what I do a lot now with startups is I want them to make new mistakes, not the ones I made. You know, so it's about telling them, hey, that 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 path, you know, is a difficult one. Now, you don't always know. And uh, we had people at Kayak who were convinced they could run an international business from Boston. They didn't have to have people around the world. And the board said, you're wrong. And they did it anyway. And they were wrong. So, you know, sometimes <laughs> you have to let people go. Uh, but. Uh, if we if we can learn from that and move on quickly, as you suggest, uh, that's the most important part. All right. Another uh, now on one of your other points that you made and that you did, uh, and I've seen this done very well. I've uh, written about it in the past. I called it a tomorrow lab. Uh, in other words, uh, pulling out that innovative team from the organization that will slow them down. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and you did that. Matter of fact, sometimes pulling them out into a separate building or a separate organization. I know I've worked with a uh, one of the top uh, drug companies where they created a tomorrow lab. So they they were innovating a new drug 
but it wasn't a pill that you take. It was a process where they took cells out of you, reconditioned them, put them back in, and it could cure your cancer. In other words, the culture didn't know how to do that. They knew right. how to make pills and give you pills, give you injections and give you injections. So they actually created what you did, Terry. They pulled them out and they gave them a separate, uh, um, you know, could hire people from outside. And so I took them out of that culture that would have slowed them down. And you mentioned the IT department and you've been a CIO, so you understand that. When you have a big IT department, it's hard to move fast. Uh, it's hard to, I mean, as a matter of fact, in some cases, it's harder to innovate because you've got so much going on. So you almost need to pull that out as well. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you're in process mode. We get, you know, our delivery muscle gets really strong and our innovation muscle weakens. And you have to do both. And you have to run the marathon and the sprint. Um, so we were the sprint and Saber was the marathon. Saber couldn't fail. We could. That was okay. I mean, can you imagine what the IT department said at Sabre when we said we're going to hook it up to the Internet? Yeah. No, evil, yeah. right? Took a long time to convince them. So I like to say you need to put the new idea in a greenhouse. It's snowing outside, and that, that little flower is going to die unless you protect it in the greenhouse when it's small. Then when it grows up, you can, you can decide what to do. You can spin it out. You can make it a division. Or a, a wonderful lady at REI told me, we had an e-commerce division, but when e-commerce grew up, we turned the org chart on its side and poured the internet in and made everybody responsible for it. Didn't need it anymore. I mean, businesses, as you know, used to have the Department of Electricity in 1900. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Nobody would think about that today. The department, I had a, a $350 million telephone budget at American Airlines. Their budget is probably zero now. It's all VoIP, right? So- you protect things when they're small so they grow big and eventually Travelocity spun out and went public. But here's an interesting lesson. After two years of being public, Sabre said, we want it back. And they took it private. And I quit and so did most of the other senior executives because we were sure they were going to screw it up. They took a $1.2 billion company. They sent marketing back to marketing, IT back to IT, accounting to accounting. And five years later, they sold it to Expedia for $280 million. So they destroyed about a billion dollars of value by forgetting the beating heart of Travelocity and running it like a business. So if I'm a smaller organization, you know, I'm not a real big company. Maybe I've only got uh, 50 employees or 100 employees. Um, are the lessons that you're teaching only good for a big organization or how could you apply them to a smaller one? I want to pull that out of you a little bit. Well, if you're only 50 people, you're not going to create a separate division. You're not going to move out off site. Probably you don't need to, but you need to have a culture of experimentation. That's key and allow some failure and put some money in the budget to say, this is my money for change. I'm not investing in a new stamping machine. I'm investing in a new technology or I'm investing in a new business line or a new business model. Or I'm going to try 3D printing. You need to be experimenting and understand that it might fail. Uh, but unleash those people and let them move at speed. You know, when COVID came along, I think it was Best Buy had an 18-month plan to go to curbside delivery. When COVID hit, they did it in three days. Okay. Well, the boss won't forget that. So you really can do this fast. So unleash them. Let them do it even in a small company, but continue to experiment. If you don't, then there'll be a nice historical marker in your small town that said, here lies the Jones company. They were great for a hundred years and then they forgot to change. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, another uh, another thing to look at is you get the behaviors you reward. And yes. if you, uh, and you want to reward uh, risk-taking, innovation, again, but we want to learn from those things. Again, yes. so there's a, there's a profitable hook to it. And really what, what we need to do, whether you're a large organization or a small organization, uh, is we have, here's what we'd like to do. Here's the budget. Here's the time. Here's what it's going to cost. Here's why we want to do it. And we'd like to be able to do that. But in today's world of beyond exponential change, uh, I would like you to add one more element, and that is the cost of not doing it. So oh, what if huge. we don't innovate? 
What if we don't spend the money and spend the time? What if we don't do this? What happens to our relevancy? What happens to our position in the marketplace? Are we empowering our, not just our known competitors, because I'm not worried about the competitors you know, know about. I'm worried about the ones that are coming out of left and right field using new technology to redefine and reinvent because you aren't. Well, look at, look at uh, Booking.com, which is now worth more than the top five airlines combined. Right. Um, you know, came out of nowhere. The airlines lost control of their distribution. Uh, th there's a great quote that said the startup wins. Th the battle is over if the startup gets the distribution before the incumbent gets the innovation. Uh, so if you gain that distribution before the before you see it coming. I mean, Tesla last year made more than GM and Ford combined. Profitability. Uh, they poo pooed it for a lot of years. Now, props to Mary Barra. And props to Ford, they are now all in. But it, it, you know, it took them a long time to get all in. So the cost of not innovating is extremely large. Um, you know, the, the chairman of American Airlines happened to be on a plane with the chairman of IBM, and they invented the Saber system, uh, for the first online, res well, the first computer reservation system in the airline business. That later became a, a two and a half billion dollar company, right? But it was a huge risk. It cost more than a 707 to build it. Right. You've got right. to take those innovative risks. And it, and it paid great dividends for America. All right. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, innovation. Um, and, and again, you did talk about culture and culture shifts. But, you know, really, we're not talking about, in my mind, changing the culture versus elevating it to increasing relevance and accelerated innovation. Uh, in other words, uh, we build a culture and it takes time to build one. You put it together. And as a matter of fact, culture is the one competitive advantage that you have that cannot be copied by a competitor. Uh, so culture, I mean, if you've got a patent, you know what? I can get around that. If you've got a technology, you know what? I can find a way of copying that. But if you've got a culture that's a killer culture, well, that's going to be a tough one. But again, a culture is not static. It's dynamic in a world like this. We need to be bringing the innovation part into the culture and, again, elevating it uh, as best we can, regardless of our size. Well, a good example of that is Southwest Airlines. They've been <clears throat> honored for their culture forever. A very positive culture, very friendly people. It was all about speed, turning airplanes fast. You know, they, they focused on we're not going to change. We're not going to feed people. We got one kind of airplane. Um, but their culture was also very cheap. I used to run their IT systems in America. I had to go and tell Herb Kelleher they had the oldest IBM mainframe in the world under lease. You know, we were going to Radio Shack to buy parts. Herb, come on. Uh, he squeezed a few more years out of it. And look what happened to them just now. Right, right. They failed right. because they did not invest in a, in a new system for flight planning and crew allocation as they got so huge. They starved it. And they admitted they starved it. So their culture of their people culture was great. Their culture with customers was great, but they were, they were a little too cheap. Uh, well, uh, and and they it, couldn't do that. They were also very proud of their uh, quarterly returns no. uh, to investors. And when it becomes the quarterly return, well, let's give them a bigger return rather than up, update all of this stuff that is critical. Uh, let's do a buyback. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, look, look what you said. Kramer was just on. And he was praising Tesla, which he never does. But then he said, you know, that darn Ford, they better make the quarter. Well, Farley is over there investing like crazy to ensure the life of Ford not to make the quarter. You know, he's trying to change the dealer structure. He's trying to change to electrification. And he might miss the quarter. And boy, if as an investor, I would hope he did. You know, and, well, yes, and change yes. the business. I think uh, that's where... Uh, a lot of the advisors and a lot of the Wall Street people get us uh, mixed up because we think it is about the quarter rather than it's about the future. And right. again, we want to make money in the present. But if that means I'm not making money in the future, I got a problem. Yeah. And it's too bad because everybody cuts the startup a break. So Amazon doesn't make money for 14 years. Tesla doesn't make money for 12 years. Nobody cares. But if Ford misses the quarter, you're dead. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough game going public. It's much yeah. easier to be private. <laughs> yeah, you reminded me. I first uh, encountered uh, 
Elon Musk way back in the early 2000s when he was first really showing off his very first vehicle, which was, I think, a Lotus that he had converted or something like that. Yeah, the Roadster. <clears throat> and uh, the question was asked of him, are, uh, are you trying to become the leading uh, luxury electric vehicle brand in the United States and in the world? And he said, no, I'm trying to start the revolution. Yeah. There you now, go. there's a guy with a bigger vision. Much bigger vision. Which, by the way, bingo, is happening. Yeah, and if, even, there was a quote. Did, the revolution would not be happening. One of his board members said today, um, he wouldn't care if Tesla went bankrupt if there was a better company who was changing the world to electrification. He doesn't care. He, you know, he was he wants a greener world, and that's what he wants to do. And, right. and he looks at problems in an interesting way. You know, it's it's first principles. Go back to physics. Well. Why are rockets so expensive? Well, because we throw them away. Well, why don't we bring them back? Oh, you can't bring them back and land them again. Well, maybe we can. Uh, and he did and changed the whole rocket business. So in the beginning of this program, I talked about how technology is, new technologies are coming out on a daily basis, giving us the ability to redefine and reinvent, to turn the impossible into the possible. Some of them are even free. Uh, and you know we don't want to squander this moment. We're in a unique point in human history right now, and it is about innovation. And again, I, I titled this program about innovation from the inside of an organization, but let's talk about some of the other <coughs> innovative principles that you've applied. For example, I mentioned kayak.com, uh, founding that. You ran that for uh, seven years and, uh, and again, sold it for well, well over a billion dollars. Not bad for seven years worth of work. Uh, what are some of the key principles that you use to innovate that whether they're from the inside or the outside, because frankly, sure. a lot of them are the same principles. Well, you know, kayak was a, I was founding chairman. We had two great founders and the CEO and the CTO. CTO was the best hiring manager I ever met. He would go anywhere in the world to find an A-level engineer because A-level engineers are 10 times more productive than B and C level engineers. And when he finished that interview, and he never hired people based on money. He got him excited about the vision of the company. We're going to change travel, right? The last question he said is, who's the smartest person you know? And then you go interview that person anywhere in the world. He hired an Olympic uh, gold medalist just because he said, if that person can get a gold medal, he can do almost anything. And he did. So we were able to go public with 200 people because the team was so strong. Uh, and so don't hire your best friend, hire the best person, right? And, and, and also, and I didn't do this quickly enough at Travelocity, if somebody isn't cutting it, you, you really need to find another thing for them to do. Um, nobody ever was fired too late. You know, it's just, we need, uh, we need to move on and say, hey, l let's, let's fire them, you know, or ask them to move on right now. You have to have a strong team in a startup. It's critical. And that doesn't happen a lot in big corporations. You know, big corporations, it's, it's very hard to change people. Um, but in small organizations, you do that really quickly. And we did, you know, 20% of what you see at Kayak most every day is a test. We are constantly testing, generally failing, but continuously learning. And that's super important. And right. sometimes you have to just, yes. yes. Yeah, sometimes you have to just hang on. So when we went to the airlines and said, we have this new idea, we're going to collect all the flights and people can click through. But unlike Google, they don't go to the home page. They go to the last page and they put in their name and they credit card and they buy. It converts way better than Google. The airline said, that is awesome idea. We like that, but we're not going to pay you anything. And we went, whoa, a few of them paid, but we were VC backed. So we sent them a lot of traffic. We built all that traffic. We got the distribution. And then one day we turned it off. And they called up and said, where's the traffic? And we said, same place your money is, nowhere. And they said, okay, okay, we'll pay. So I don't know if we invented ransomware, but we got the distribution first, and then they were kind of hooked, right? So well, we yeah. had to stay with the program for a while. Well, if you think about it, that's kind of what's happening with chat GPT, uh, where we put it out for free to the world. It's the fastest growing of any software. Right. And, uh, and what happens after a while? It gets slow and it gets clogged up and you can't get in. 
So uh, in other words, it's one of the best marketing plans of all, get everybody hooked on it. Then they can't get in because too many people are on it. And now what do we have? Well, we have the paid version and we have the next version. <laughs> exactly. So, and so I'll tell you what happened. So I, I'm uh, a consultant to a company called Copilot. And this morning we were to do a demo of chat GBD for travel where I could say, I want to go to Dubai tomorrow, come back Thursday, first class and bang, you get the flights. Chat GBT was down. In two hours, the team converted to a competitor and we had the demo running. So um, there are competitors out there. And if you don't run fast, people are going to copy what you're doing and away you go. So I, I'm real excited about Chat GBT. I've been in AI for the last 10 years. I had an AI company that was too early, uh, but we're not too early now. I, I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well, the other thing that you are, uh, Terry, which I, I, I've been, of course, teaching people and uh, that anybody that listens to me, and that is you aren't just reactionary, you're anticipatory. Uh, you're seeing where we have something major, something disruptive, and you're looking at how can I be the disruptor? Uh, how can I be the positive disruptor creating the changes and the transformations that need to happen to elevate relevancy and accelerate growth? And um, so I think that's a, been a key element of yours is being able to spot those early things. Also, uh, here's an interesting thing. I was with uh, a group of uh, 10,000 not long ago, did a survey. I was with uh, a board of 28, all uh, executives in 28 different companies that were made up this board. I've been with a number of leaders in the last, uh, oh, let's say in the last month. And I've been asking for a little show of hands. How many of you I have used chat? And the number is so small, it's unbelievable, of leaders. Now, if we go down in the organization with younger people, of course, you'd find yeah. a lot of them. But <laughs> leaders is not doing it. Now, here's my message to you all as a leader right now. You need to go and get on chat to understand the power of what's happening and realize we're at the base of a mountain of AI and what it can do. I mean, right now it's based on version four, followed by version five, version six. In other words, giving us amazing capabilities. We need to be on understanding what this is and start harnessing it. Well, that, that's right. Look, I like to say that disruption and innovation are just two sides of the same coin. The only reason you call it a disruption is because you didn't do it. If you did it, it would be an innovation. Right. But you, didn't, you didn't move. Remember Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Oh, They're yeah. being chased across the desert. And Robert Redford looks around and says, I couldn't do that. Could you do that? How can they do that? Who are those guys? And that's what most companies say. Who are those guys? Instead of saying, how can we do that? We have things startups would kill for. We have the assets, the brand, the supply chain, the sales force, the factory. Gosh, if I was a startup, I wanted all those things. All you have is no innovation. <laughs> you need to be looking. My book, Disruption Off, goes through about 12 disruptive technologies with examples. That's the first half of the book. That's basically to scare the heck out of you. And the second half is what do, what do I do about it? How do I run the marathon in the sprint? How do I change? How do I adapt that technology for us? Uh, because large corporations have so many assets they can bring to bear if they'd only take a risk and fail and stop people from saying no. In big companies, everybody can say no. Hardly anybody can say yes. <laughs> so you need to change that to say, it's our job, legal, purchasing, manufacturing, service, to get this new idea over the finish line, not to figure out how we can kill it and go back to doing our email. So, Terry, based on <clears throat> the two books that you've written, again, let's just put those up because I want people to be able to see. I'm recommending them. Uh, so it's on innovation. Really encourage you to get that and disruption off. Both are uh, really di different elements of our discussion today. And I think you would really enjoy those. And by the way, you can also find out more of what Terry does by going to that uh, website. All right. By the way, one other thing, I'll just use this as a window to put in a plug for it. And that is uh, my latest list of 25 technologies. These are the 25 technology hard trends. Uh, take a look at that. Make sure you can download those for free. Uh, it's my 40th edition of that. Holy cow, I've been doing that for 40 years. 
And uh, I think if you look that over, you look for with your opportunity antenna up, how can I use any of these tools, any one of these things to innovate, to be what I would call a positive disruptor. So Terry, again, going back to your books, um, you have uh, a lot of guiding principles in there as well as actions people should take. So let's, let's talk about actions we would like this group that's listening to us today to take when we're done with our interview. What are some things that they should do? A better yet, let me make it a must do. All right. Forget the should do's. You don't have time for that. What are some of the must do's that they should do to make sure they are leveraging the power of what's inside? And I love what you were getting into of leveraging the assets we already have, but in new ways. Go for it. That, that's right. I mean, look, you've got to listen as a leader. You, you've got to listen to what your people are saying. The people on the line, the people in customer service, the people in manufacturing, they have great ideas. But a lot of people aren't listening. There are too many filters. So the best ideas come from the bottom. Look at Travelocity. We started paging people, paging, it was that long ago, when their flights were late in 1996. That came from a customer service agent, got tired of answering the phone and said, can't we page them? I mean, we were the first company in the world to do it. We started sending emails to people when their flights were delayed. Right? or when the fare went down. And that came from a programmer. But you have to reach down and listen to those ideas and then celebrate that you really want change. And then you'll start to get it. And then, as I said, kill projects, not people, uh, so that people know that as a middle manager, I'm rewarded for change. You get what you reward, as you said. It's, it's critical to have those failures and those small successes to move forward. And then you need to read Dan's list of 25 new technologies and say, have we tried any of these? You know, 90% of hearing aids are now 3D printed. That change happened in four years. The people who didn't change are toast. They're gone, right? Um, and new entrants came in. Uh, so these kind of changes can happen very quickly in industries, and you have to listen to them. I encourage people to go to the Silicon Valley Petting Zoo, which means – Go out to the valley and go around and meet the VCs. They're happy to meet you. Little companies, the number one thing they want is to make big companies, right? And to meet them and to get acquired. So go see them. And maybe you could be inspired by their ideas. I was at a dinner with the head of American Express. He was out there twice a year. He said, look, we started as a freight company. Now we're a financial services company. I know in 20 years we're going to be something else. I just got to figure out what it's going to be. Right? Yeah, That's the attitude exactly. you have to have. You know, uh, something you mentioned there is kind of interesting, and that is uh, two elements. One, one of the jobs I had back uh, when I was in high school, uh, it, it makes money on the side, uh, I was working at a, uh, at a pretty good size manufacturing company. And of course, I was a gopher, go for this, go for that. And, uh, and I, uh, they, it turned out, I found out that they pay for uh, innovations, for ideas that they use. So when I heard that, uh, and I was with the other workers. I said, oh, I got some ideas. I want to make that money. And they said, oh, don't give them anything. All the workers that don't submit any ideas. And I said, why? And they said, well, Fred submitted an idea and uh, they did it, but he got nothing for it. And Jim submitted an idea and he got no recognition for it. So uh, if you're going to unleash that, I've seen it squandered by they put, you get everybody excited about giving you ideas, but nobody lets you know that they've looked at it. Nobody lets you know they've looked, even if it, they're not going to pursue it. Thank you, Terry, for submitting that idea. Yeah, let me give you a track on where it's going. And by the way, one other little element, and I'll let you jump in, and that is the initial person with the idea, I would call that person the ideator, the person with the idea. Sure. And they are seldom the person that takes it all the way to the finish. Oh, that's right. Almost never. That happens I, in startups. Oh, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I have suggested and has been done with companies is to always recognize the idea door throughout the process, including at the end. So when the celebration happens, the idea tour is part of that celebration. And you wouldn't have what happened to those guys uh, back in my early days of uh, working. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you an example of an idea program that did work. We added it to American Airlines. So if you submitted an idea, they figured out the economic value, and you got a piece. It was done with sort of green stamps. You could get goods and services. My wife got a mink coat. I wouldn't buy her one, but she got one. She had a great idea. 
But the other thing that was so key was each idea was reviewed by one manager from the department you were in and two managers from different departments who Ooh, had like a different that. perspective. So we had a mechanic who invented that little walk the plank thing that they use at the airport so a regional jet can connect to a jet bridge. Because before, you had to walk through the rain and the snow. That guy yep. submitted that idea to the maintenance department, and they said, oh, jet bridges are too expensive, and we're out here in the rain and the snow. The customer should be too. I did tonight. <laughs> then in our new program, that idea went to the head of maintenance, but also to the head of marketing and the CFO, who both said, what a wonderful idea. People will like regional jets, and we love flying them because they're cheap. They approved the idea and the guy got a reward. So you need to get around the naysayer by spreading that idea widely through the organization because somebody's going to latch on to it. They're, they're even at Shell has an internal Kickstarter. If your idea gets turned down, you can go to internal Kickstarter and they might fund it for you and let it go from there. So there are a lot of ways to nurture those ideas because they're just a little spark and it's so easy for that spark to go out unless you nurture it. Wow, those last two were unbelievably powerful. I love those, and uh, uh, and I think we're at the, at a point in time where we got to wrap this up. Uh, I I know I know it's sad because we we got a roll going, but uh, once again, let's put Terry's books up on and his website. Uh, I really suggest you get those books; they're right on target. This is the golden era of innovation and positive disruption. Again, you don't want to be the disrupted. You would rather be the disruptor. So I recommend you get those books. And uh, Terry, thank you so much for being part of this. And uh, thank and you, Dan. Your wisdom it was with great. everyone. Lots really of fun. Appreciate it.